Good morning, everybody. Let me take this time to welcome you back to church. I want to thank the Lord for what He is doing. I want to remind you that wherever you are, it's a holy ground because what makes it holy is the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know in your living rooms, in your bedrooms, the Lord Jesus Christ is there with you. So I want you to reference this time, even as we share the word of God. Uh, let us pray. Our precious mighty Father in heaven, once again, we want to thank you, gracious God. What a mighty God you are. What a loving God you are. Through it all, you have seen us to this time. We have not recorded any death in the house, not because of who we are, but because of who you are in our lives. Eternal Rock of Ages, I want to thank you for this opportunity that has been given to me by the leadership even to share the word of life with your people. Father, I ask that you speak through me. Let me be your mouthpiece for this 30, 35 minutes. Let me speak mysteries. Let revelations come out of my, the womb of my spirit. Bless your people as you will bless me also. That your name alone may be glorified. In the precious, mighty name of Jesus Christ, I have declared. Amen. Brethren, we are very, very grateful to the Lord for inspiring his servant, the general overseer of this great mission, to give us a powerful monthly declaration to, I mean, to help us go through this month of December. To crown this challenging year 2020. What a year. A year full of challenges. Despite it all. We can look back and say. If God had not been there for me. I never would have made it. The minute I said I'm sleeping. I'm falling, your love. God took hold and held me fast. When I was upset and beside myself, you calmed me down and shared me up. That's pain. That was pain by the sweet psalmist of Israel. And let me complete that uh, statement by reading another um, writings of uh, the psalmist of Israel, King David. In Psalm 124, verses 2 to 8. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the, swollen, then the swollen waters will have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as a prey to their feet. Our soul has escaped as a bed from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Brethren, what a year. Who would have thought in January that this year would be like this? Over 317,000 people have lost their life. Brent, I know for sure, this is a testimony of at least one person in this congregation. I know I do have a witness that the Lord has been gracious to you. The Lord has been marvelous to you. We have not recorded any death. The one who has said we will finish strong, despite the fact... Of all these things that are happening here, we will finish strong at the end of this year in Jesus' name. It has been a year, but the Lord has seen us through. Praise be to his holy name. Truly, the snare is broken and we have escaped. If you are able to finish this year's race strong, 
you will surely finish the race set before you gloriously. Amen. The Lord who has started with us will finish with us in a wonderful way in the precious mighty name of Jesus. None of us will fall by the wayside. The God who started with us will end with us. He will end with our families. He will end with our husbands, with our wives. All of us at the end of this year, despite all these things, we will see each other again and we will rejoice. Brethren, I'm bringing in a message titled, Finishing Strong. And my principal text is taken from Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. If you don't mind, you, I mean, you may want to open your, I mean, your uh, Bibles to Hebrews 12, 1 to 4, as we read the word of God together. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such a hostility from sinners against himself. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted blood, I mean, yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. Brethren, whenever we see a sentence starting with therefore in the Bible, it refers us to the importance of the previous verses. In this particular instance, reference was made to the who is who in the cloud of witnesses. The Bible introduces us to imperfect saints of God so that we may have examples to refer to and conclude that Imperfect men and women can run this race to a conclusive end and finish strong. God used the Old Testament personalities to give us a covering. God used the personalities in the church, I mean, the cloud of witnesses to help us see that all the Lord requires of us is to focus on Him. Sometimes we will stumble, sometimes we will fall. In moments like that, we are admonished to just keep on. Keeping on and focusing on Christ, He will surely see us to the end. Most of the cloud of witnesses are imperfect men and women. They were imperfect men and women made perfect by the grace of God. Not by their own strength, not because of what they can do, but by the grace of God. If you have been bugged by your past life of sin, just remember that David could relate to you. You only need to do what he did. He confessed and repented. Quoted from um, Psalm 51, 10 to 11. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. If you become fearful, you can look unto Elijah, who after killing 400 prophets of Baal, was scared to death and ran for his dear life at the sound of a woman called Jezebel. He has to be relieved of his job. If you are one who has denied your relatives, who has denied brethren, you can look at Abraham, who denied Sarah and called her his sister to avoid getting into trouble. Yes, the cloud of witnesses were imperfect men and women whose perfection was made possible through Christ. Now, let me quickly de deal with uh, the issue of finishing strong. What does it mean to finish strong? Finishing strong is making it to the end of the race without compromise. That will be my definition of finishing strong. Making it to the end of the race without compromise. Let me quickly move to considering some characteristics of running a race and finishing strong. First of all, one thing that in, in such a race that I want you to remember is that the race is the, this race that I'll be talking about today 
will be the most important race ever that you will ever run. Number two, finishing strong is a choice. It's a choice you have to make. Finishing strong require, requires a lot of self-sacrifice, that, like you will see now. Finishing strong is by determination. I've determined to know no other God except the one crucified and resurrected. Finishing strong requires running according to the rules prescribed by the organizer of the race. Finishing strong in this race, I want to inform you and counsel you that it's not a sprint. It's not a race of 100 yards, I mean, or 200 yards or 1,000 yards. It's a lifelong race. The race is a marathon which requires endurance. The race has marked out rules. That is what I will call the rules of engagement. So you don't run it the way you want. The race is not a race in the pursuit of greatness. Neither is it a race in the pursuit of of uh, popularity. It is a race in pursuit of godliness. The race is not a competition. You don't compete in this race. Finishing strong requires total dependency on the Lord. So let us set aside and lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Brethren, there are so many races in life, but there's one race that each one of us must be enlisted willingly or unwillingly. There are so many races that we run in life, but this particular race that we're talking about this morning, it's a race, whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, the moment you're born, the moment you are entered into the race, and this race that you will run until you are called home. My prayer for you is that you may, may you be engaged in the one race that is needful. That is the race to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a race you will never finish until you answer the call. The saints of all did not finish until they saw the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. You also will continue in this race until the very end. My prayer is that when the last trumpet shall sound, may you be found sprinting gloriously to the finish line. Amen. As I said, brethren, there are so many races each one of us will be involved in during our lifetime. The race to be wealthy, the race about marriage, the race about our profession, the race about our children, all so many different kinds of races we will enter into. But there is a, but a bigger race, the race of eternity, which will, be, which will be the focus of this message, is the race that I will be talking about this, this morning. Like I said, there are so many races. Professionally, you want to excel. Maritally, you want to excel. I mean, when it comes to financial, you want to excel. There are so many races, you know. But all those, all those races are temporary. Because once you finish one, you are entering into another. But this one race is the race you cannot afford to lose. Now, let me differentiate the other races from the race to it, I mean, for eternity that I'm talking about this morning. I said there are many races that you will be involved in, but this other race that I'm talking about is the only race. In other races, you compete to win. I mean, you compete. It's a competition, but in this race that we're talking about this morning, there's no competition. The rules of engagement are determined by the organizers of, this, of, the ra of the, all those races that we're talking about. But the race that I'm talking about, the race, is determined, the rule of engagement is determined by heaven. In the other races, you will win perishable crowns, but in this race that I'll be talking about, you will win an imperishable crown. 
The other races you enter into it at your own will. There are people who will say, I don't want to marry. There are people who will say, I don't want to get wealthy. There are people who will say, I don't want to do this other thing. I don't want to do that other thing. But this other race, whether you like it or not, you are entered into it the very first day you breathe your first breath. I say you gain a temporary reward here. Maybe you are wealthy. Maybe you have a successful marriage. Maybe you, you have, I mean, children are doing very well. But the other, you gain heaven. The cloud of witnesses are not interested in your race for wealth. Neither are they interested in your race, I mean, the race about marriage or the race about profession. But the only race they are sharing you about is the race to make heaven. All the other races are a subset of this one important race. The moment we run this race as prescribed, success in all other races will be added. All other, all other races will be won, and we will finish other races strong. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things, all other races, all other accomplishments is embedded in this one. All other things shall be added to you. He said, I would have fainted if I have not believed that I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. My mind is made up and I am determined to fight every battle that comes my way to be successful in this race. Running this race is not a sprint. Again, it is a marathon. According to our text, if you look back at our text, there are four major things we need to do in order to finish this race strong. And I want you to pay very particular attention to the four things. Number one, it says setting aside every weight that ensnares us. That's number one. Number two, setting aside the sin we so easily ensnares us. Number three, running with endurance the race that is set before us. And number four, running, I mean, fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. Running without a baggage. In this journey, which is a marathon, it is impossible to carry any baggage. If you if you have ever watched any, I mean, any of these classical movies, the, the idea of running a race almost started with the, with the Roman Empire. And those people who, uh, who are enlisted in the marathon, they run this race without, any, most of the time, it's just a little, I mean, a little cloth that they put on. So they cannot afford to, put, to, to carry on any baggages because they know the importance of this race. I said they will, the, the people who are en enlisted in this race, in the olden days, they would do everything to run and win. And most of the time, they run without any hindrances of clothing. Brethren, in this race, we have three major enemies. In the race of life, we have three major enemies. I will mention them quickly. The devil is enemy number one. The world is enemy number two. And yourself is, number, is enemy number three. Remember, all these three will try as much as possible to see that one does not finish strong and finish well. Now let me go to the things that will constitute a baggage. What are the things that will constitute a baggage? Here, I'm not talking about sin now. Baggages, I'm not talking about sin. Most of the time, the baggages could be just your habits. Habits that we have grown used to, that is very difficult for us to separate ourselves from. For instance, let's just take that simple thing, watching the TV. Most of the time, you spend hours upon hours watching TV at the expense of studying our Bible. It could be your love for food. Fasting may be very foreign to you if you love food so much. 
This is where the devil comes in. I, 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 the, the devil does not bring you what you do not want. One thing that I found out even as early in my, in my Christian journey that I found out early is that the devil will attract you with what he knows you love. If I'm not a smoker, the devil cannot make me smoke. If, if I'm not a drunkard, the devil will never make me a drunkard. If you are not somebody who commits infidelity all the time, that is not what the, the devil will flash at your face. But when the, the, because the devil knows our weak points, the devil is an enticer. You bring the baggage to the table and he entices you to do it. The devil cannot make you to do what you are not interested in. If the devil finds out that you are a TV lover, he will encourage you to spend a lot of time watching TV. If he knows that you are somebody who loves food, he will allow you to spend a lot of time eating junk foods and not having any restraint. He will persuade you that what you are doing is cool. Number two, setting aside the sin which so easily ensnares us. What is the sin that we are talking about here? There are three types of sin that I want to mention here. Sin number one is the sin of doing what you are not supposed to do. That's number one. Number two is the sin of neglecting what you are supposed to do. And number three, the sin of unbelief. Brethren, I want you to listen to me very carefully. The church is now involved in giving prophecies that the Lord has not sent them. In the past election, you will have seen so many prophecies that the Lord has not sent them to, to deliver. And the moment we do this, the moment we relegate the importance of the church. Why don't we just keep our mouth shut and allow God to do whatever he wants to do? I, I said, doing what we are not supposed to do. That's number one. We, we were not given that prophecies to give. The church have, they, they've already neglected what they are supposed to do. They are, they are majoring in what they are not supposed to do. The church is meant to pray for all leaders, regardless what political party they belong to. But are we doing that? No. I remember when, when Pres President Obama was on, I mean, was the, our president in this country. Some people, Christians, made shirts. May, may her daughter die. May his, may his uh, house be, become empty. May this be that. And they quote scriptures and they put it and people were wearing it. Doing what we are not supposed to do. The second is doing, is neglecting doing those things that we are supposed to do, which I've mentioned. We are supposed to pray for, for, for the nation. We are supposed to pray for every leader. The lead, he said there is no leader that can be a leader that has not been at least sanctioned by heaven. Even the, 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 I mean, the dictators and some other things, heaven must know about it before it can happen. I said these super apostles are more interested in amazing wealth at the expense of a rich deposit in heaven. They are more interested in popularity than being holy. They are more interested in growing a larger congregation at the expense of building disciples who are heaven bound. They have enlisted in the Devil 401 class. Instead of magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ, they are magnifying the devil. It's a pity. But the church must wake up. If we don't wake up, I pray that things will not just be like it was in Turkey. Turkey used to be a nation of Christians. But now they say 99 point something percent, they are Muslims. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Amen. The other, uh, the other thing that I mentioned here is the sin of un unbelief. It's the sin of unbelief. And that is one major sin that Apostle Paul was talking about. 
you know, if you look at what is happening now in the Christendom, the sin of unbelief is, is creeping in. People are saying, oh, they've been saying Jesus Christ will come, Jesus Christ will come. He has not come. Even general overseers appreciate that message. They appreciate the message that this, this world is, they are living in this world as if this is the end of everything. They are li living large at the expense of living holy. They don't believe that there is a heaven again. They believe that everything ends up here. But we know better. We know that's not true. We know that there is a heaven. The rich, the rich man, you remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man found out too late. And all those things are written for our own example. That we may take examples from now and say, Lord, I will serve you. Brethren, when you have the revelation of whom you are in Christ, you'll be able to despise all rejections. Most of the time, we, we still carry that, I mean, this guilt of our past years of our past life, thinking the Lord Jesus Christ is like us, that even after the, the wound has healed, we say it always looks, I mean, leaves a scar. But that's not the Lord Jesus Christ. Once your sin is forgiven, it's forgiven totally, it's not, never remembered again. Because there are some people, because of, of unbelief, they believe that uh, once they have committed a sin in the past, that that sin is always going beyond, even when they have confessed it. And you still see people confessing, I mean, sins of 20 years past. Oh, Lord, I remember I did this today. The moment you come to him, the moment you believe in him, the moment you give your life to Christ, he has already forgiven you. Move on. You are clean. You are his. It is like you have never committed any sin before once he has forgiven you. So learn to forgive yourself once Jesus Christ has forgiven you. Number three on our list is running with endurance. We have projected that the Christian life is, I mean, is so easy. That is what people are doing now. Even people are taking, they are taking tithes from arm robbers. You know, just come as you are. No, there is no, there is no message of, 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 uh, of repentance. There is no message of sanctification. There is no message of holiness. Just come as you are. We have made it easy. The moment you come to Jesus Christ, everything will be rosy. No. That is not the message of the cross. It's not. Because we are telling people that the Christian life is so easy, that sort, that sort of hinders us from being mentally prepared for the marathon race before us. The church has now become the easy bed of roses where every wish is granted, either holy or unholy. There is no more talk about repentance, no more talk about sanctification, no, no of carrying your cross daily and following him. The phrase, no cross, no crown, has been wiped out from the modern-day Christian self-written books. Brethren, if you think that, 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 I mean, running this race is that easy, why will the crowd of witnesses, some of them were burnt to life. Some of them were sold. Some of them were, were decapitated. Some of them, some of them they, they were, I mean, after being, being crucified, they poured acid on them so that they would never, I mean, nothing will ever happen to them again. Why would Jesus Christ, you say, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it. Why was he hanging, hanging on the cross of Calvary? He could have saved himself. But because of this, because he knew what was ahead of him, the crown that he was running for, the, 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 the place that his father has set, set, set apart for him. My question to you is, what are you doing? What are you doing to inherit this thing? What are you doing? We must be prepared to take things as it comes. Brethren, I want all of you to, <laughs> I said here, it's my, I mean, I, it's my uh, joy if all the congregation in the House of Hope will love me. But I know that is not possible. I know that is not happen. I know it won't happen. Because the moment you are competing for popularity, you are competing for people to love you, there are people that you won't be able to tell the truth. I will be foolish and living in illusion if I ever think all of you will, in this congregation will, will ever love me. Some of you will love me. What matters most 
in this journey to heaven is how is how I process this idea of not your of you not loving me. I can I cannot go back and decide not to love you if I want to make heaven. I cannot control your loving me, but I can control my response to your not loving me. You know, God uses those things to train us, to develop us and grow us. You do not grow your muscle in a day. You train to develop. You train to develop it. Doing that is not easy. It comes with pain. So also our growing in the Lord will cause us some pain without being bitter. There are so many things that men of God who suffer this in, in this place that they've encountered. I remember uh, one of our pastors who's going to be with the glory, to be, I mean, to be with the Lord in glory. He was slapped one day in the church. He didn't say anything. He said, the Lord Jesus Christ, I've, I've already bought my hands. I can't use it to fight anymore. Do you think that person loves him? No. And number four that I want to talk, of, talk about here is fixing your eyes on Christ Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Christ. We are not meant to compete in this journey. This journey is not about greatness. God has not called us to pursue greatness, but to pursue godliness. I believe there are a couple of people in our congregation who have run a marathon. If you, I mean, if you, if you have people who have run a marathon here in this, in this, in this church, or let's, take, let's not just consider marathon alone. If you have people who have done pharmacy in this, in this, uh, in this congregation, if a new person, if a young man or a young woman wants to go into pharmacy school, what do you think the best thing to do? The best thing is to seek counsel from the person who has done it before. And that is why we must look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Because he was the one who, run, who ran this, this, I mean, this race perfectly. He ran it perfectly. And that's why fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ is so important in running this race. How did he run it? And that is why you must begin to say every time, ask yourself when situation comes, what will the Lord Jesus Christ do? How will he run this race? He had the power to say, I won't go to the cross and nobody could have done anything. He had the power to, 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 I mean, to do things to the people who are crucifying him. But he will, not, he will not do it because he wanted to set a good example for us. And today we are able to, to look at that, he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This, Jesus Christ was despised. I mean, people, when they got to his hometown in Nazareth, and he told them, this prophecy, when he read Isaiah, and he said, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your ears today. And people began to say, what do you call yourself? Which prophecy is fulfilled today? You? You? The son of Mary and Joseph? But he did not revive. He did not fight back. When the people even called him, he I mean, he, that he was possessed by a demon, he did not do anything he just left them. He said, he knows who he is. When we are comfortable in who we are, we don't fight every battle. Because every battle is not to be fought if you are going to make it to the end of this race. I say all the, all the church wants nowadays is a place of authority, a place of glory, a place of greatness. No more crucifying of the flesh. No more laboring. The church is gradually going back to the dark days of the church when they thought one could buy salvation. You know, in the old, in the, when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the popes were controlling that, the, I mean, there were things that they would say, I mean, I, I've forgotten the name they call it. They, you would buy it so that, that, as they said, after you spend maybe a thousand years in the purgatory, then you will go to heaven. Or they, they, even, they took it to another level that you could buy it for, your peop, I mean, for the people who have died before if you have the money. But Christianity is not like that. Christianity is a one-on-one -on -one Martha. 
we know that if men could buy heaven, if men could purchase heaven, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man would have bought heaven, but we, I mean, we all read what happened to him. When he got there, he suddenly realized that all these glamorous things in this world will not amount to anything when the trumpet shall sound. Jeremiah 25, 5a says, If you have wrong with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? What sets us apart from the crowd? I mean, what sets apart the crowd of witnesses and the Lord Jesus Christ is their faith and their endurance. They have a, a, they have an unflinching faith in a God that promises and fulfills it. Their endurance was the manifestation of their faith. They were able to endure because they had faith. When we have faith, we will be able to go through anything that comes our way. May the Lord grant us the endurance to run this race to a conclusive end in Jesus' name. Brethren, this race is not the pursuit of greatness, neither is it the pursuit of Popularity, but finishing, oh, but finishing strong. Remember, all these glamorous things of this world will be consumed by fire, according to Apostle Peter. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Brethren, the only important thing will be our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, 8, Apostle Paul said this, and I pray, and I believe, and I think, and I, uh, my prayer is that all of us, when, this, when we are about exiting this world, that this also will be our testimony. In 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8, it says, Paul said, I've finished the race. He said, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but all who have loved is appearing. My prayer for each and every one of us is that that will be our confession when the time shall come. Let us pray. Brethren, if you are here this morning and you are the sound of my voice and you have not given your life to Christ today is the appointed time tomorrow may be too late why don't you pray this prayer with me father I know I have messed up big time but I've been told that if I have come back if I have come back if I have come back to me without a repentant heart you will not forsake me if I come back to you with a repentant heart, you will not forsake me. Forgive me all my trespasses and make me one of your disciples in the name that is above all other names, the name of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And also, if you are here and your relationship with the Lord is no more as it used to be, I want you to pray that, Lord, help me. Help me to be fervent again because I know that the, the, the trumpet will sound one day, either by death or by rapture. I want us to pray for the grace to run with endurance to the end. I also want us to pray that we will not be sidetracked by baggages. And finally, let us pray that when the role shall be called yonder, we shall all be there. Father, we thank you this morning. We give all glory and all honor to your holy name. Thank you, O gracious God, for how you have led us. Father, I just ask and I pray that Lord, Holy Spirit divine, you will remember, I mean, you remind your people, even concerning this message, that that race to eternity is the most and the only race that we should be enlisted in now. In the precious, mighty name of Jesus Christ, I have prayed. Amen.
To God be the glory uh, for the word that we have heard 